listen, one of the greatest yoga teachings, and it might even sound cliche, is for a seed to bloom, it has to be in the dark soil. We can now be seen. Hello, hello, everybody. It's another Wednesday, another talk show. Today, a little bit earlier because our guest, Lawrence J, is. Where are you on Bali, right? Indonesia. Yes, I'm in a I'm on the island of the gods. On <laughs> oh man. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I invited Lawrence today because you know in these talk shows we are up to inspire people in regarding how to find your passion. I mean not to how to find, but maybe see through a guess how did they find and maybe you get an idea how you can find a passion, purpose on life or what to do next in your life. And yeah, what is necessary then to succeed in that area or, you know, to, to lead, to be able to live from it. So yeah, I really thank you, Lawrence, for saying yes to the show. Uh, I'm excited to, you know, we didn't talk, I think for two years almost now, since the finish of the ILP. I don't know if we talked afterwards much. Uh, so yeah, I, I only followed you through the Instagram. I was like, oh man, he's on Bali now. Now, cool. I thought you were just there for a visit, but then I saw you were like staying there, man. So quick share with us, you know, how, how is life on Bali? On the island of the gods. <laughs> I, I truly love it here. I mean, it's a very special place and I think it's special because of the time, you know, I think that, uh, the fact that the world is much slower right mm -hmm. now and there's no there's very few tourists here and the people that are here are here to live basically so there's always people leaving of course but the island's not freely open like it was seven months ago which has created a new culture um and that's a lot that's a you know this place has an amazing infrastructure for it's really like blown up in terms of visitors and tourists and foreigners coming for surf and for tourism and for yoga um and that infrastructure is still in place obviously so the beautiful beaches and the, like the high quality gyms and, and and yoga and food and with all of that um, there's much less people so it's it's much more relaxing although traffic is starting to get busier after i'm here over seven months now and it's starting to get a little bit busier <clears throat> Okay, awesome. So just quick, yeah. quick thing. Uh, if you can also introduce us. So you're Lawrence J. Maybe how old? What is your profession? And and you know a little bit about yourself. I'm just like I'm. I'm so <laughs> conscious of the lighting right now and the shadow in my yeah. face. <laughs> I, I got it. Yeah, you just you just find the position. Is that better? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that that feels better. What What was the question again? Yeah, if you can introduce to us a little bit, you know, so, so how old are you, where are you coming Lawrence. from, where are you coming from, okay, and no. what's your profession, stuff like that, basically. Um, I'm from Canada, Toronto is my birthplace. I'm 41 years old, which is quite the number. Um, well, you do, don't look like one, I guess. I mean, you know. <laughs> thank you. Like one? <laughs> like one. <laughs> look like one <laughs> no no you doesn't look um, like 41 year old guy that's what i meant i mean you, you're no, too I, your face I, I is too that. relaxed to, i've to actually just rec <laughs> i've i've recently stepped into to owning that number and owning the age i think that like as you're creeping up to 40 for me it was like ooh, I'm getting old and now i'm like 41 Pretty cool. I'm a little ball. I'm happy, you know, really happy in my day to day mm -hmm. lifestyle, like never before. It's like the, a dream can come you, true. Can you just and, repeat a little bit because and, you froze? And it says that my connection is unstable, which is weird. But can you just repeat the same? The you lifestyle. Just... Okay. Okay, we're having a little bit trouble. It's like I'm in Slovenia, Loris is in Bali. So please, everybody who's watching, bear with us might happen is that better yeah now it's better uh just tell okay, so you, you, let me know yeah you just said um i just start to own that i'm 41 years old and then you were saying what 
and that the lifestyle that I'm living is really giving me the opportunity to step into that and enjoy that and like, like move towards my potential. All right, cool. So we'll get more to that, what that means, I mean, uh, later on. But let's just start with the question that we always start these shows, you know, so so younger generations can can actually uh, relate to you, uh, you know, and, and other people, you know, because I think through sharing our life, we actually relate to each other. And that's a proven thing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, how were you like a teenager? You know, what was what were you going through? Like, what was the challenges you faced? What was the positive side? It's like, who has Lauren been as a teenager? Well, as I stepped into my teenage years, 13, it's a big, it's a big number. I was, um, I'm Jewish. I grew up Jewish. So at 13, the first, the first year of teenagehood, uh, you, you do a bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. which is you go to the synagogue, you read a piece from the Bible, from what, the Torah, the Old Testament. And that's your declaration in Judaism that you are now a man. And mm -hmm. that was a really tough time because my dad had just lost his business. He had this huge knitting factory. For years, my parents were doing super well. And my dad, and then right around when I turned 13, it's like they went from driving a Mercedes to this like old brown Buick. Okay. Uh huh. And that like that really influenced me. It affected me because we moved from one house to another, and like I didn't know how to articulate that to my friends that this was going on. Because so much part of my like my thirteen year old identity was that like my parents were well off. And all of a sudden, like there was crisis in the household. Um, and I remember how it affected me for sure. Right around when I turned 13, I always loved sports right around 13. I was probably like right in the middle of like my prime of just being such a, I loved playing sports. I loved watching sports on television. I'm from Toronto. So I loved hockey and baseball, baseball, especially just love those sports and was crazy like into them um what else can i tell you about me i think that i've always been a romantic mm -hmm. even at 13 you know in what but way let me think. What, what way romantic i think it just always was like dreaming of like the ultimate partner mm -hmm. I grew up on a lot of American TV and movies and stuff like that. So I think like that probably affected me. Probably affected me. Yeah, it sure um, does, yeah. I'm trying to think at 13. I mean, you can think also when like, you know, you started at 13, but you can go like to 14, 15, then high school, you know, when you, when you go to high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things change. I'm just digging in right now. I'm yeah, digging into 13. Great. 13 and 14. These are yeah. all interesting, interesting years of my life. Um, right? I guess that's also the time that you're starting to make the transition to high school. Mm -hmm. And that was awkward and weird. That was really awkward. Like, I remember being so scared. Cause like there was, what was it called? Initiation. Like the older kids mm. were supposed to wedgie the younger kids. Like they were supposed to like pick them up by their underwear. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was crazy. That was so like just remember like running like out of school and like trying to like not be like not to be at the like not have the older kids catch you. That like that kind of stuff now is like super illegal. Mm. But when I was 13, I remember it vividly just and having, but nobody ever, I don't think anybody caught me or maybe somebody caught me and like did it once and it wasn't that bad. I kind of like stopped being afraid. It's funny how the things that you could, the stories that we create, you know, mm -hmm. especially as kids. Yeah. It's teenagers. But, you know, 
I never got a groove at my first high school. Now that I start to think about it, I never got a groove. But the thing that really got me excited about school, there was moments of excitement. I didn't really get it. I think that like the stuff that was going on at home didn't really give me the opportunity to like calmly appreciate the beauty of my teenage years. Mm. Um, there was so much identity stuff going on for my parents they were still young i was the oldest kid so they were learning how to parent on me um there was like all of a sudden at 13 and 14 you're dealing with like heavy social pressures unconsciously it's not like these are social pressures and you understand them you're just dealing with like the politics of friends and teachers and all of a sudden in high school older kids and all of a sudden the girls are hanging out with the older boys, you know, like they were in your grade and all of a sudden they're like, just like all the, all of like the rules all of a sudden change. So, so yeah. How was that for you? Like how, how, what was going on in like, you know, if we look behind the scenes, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I had a girlfriend. I remember that I was, like crazy about before high school but then like once high school happened i like it was over like and it, and i didn't understand that even i didn't understand but all of a sudden the world had changed it was the new normal mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it was a new normal the circumstances were different and under new circumstances i was just like okay that, this isn't working um so yeah I think that for me, ultimately, if I think about it deeply, I dove into sports, like I dove into playing, to watching, and also to things like music and things like like rap music. Like there was, there was, th there was places that I could express myself. And I think in a social sphere, I, I was probably awkward in the sense that it was much easier for me to, to be social in the context of a team mm -hmm. where there's a common goal. But in like social life, at I mean, these, this is such an interesting conversation already for <laughs> me because... Yeah, it's like we don't think about how we were every day, like how we were as a teenagers, you know, you just you just leave now and, you know, that happened. But yeah, why I'm always asking that is because, you know, people can then relate, you know, there are people who, I mean, teenagers, young people who are having, you know, like what you had at one moment. You know, you can afford everything, and the next moment you said Brown Buick, right? From Mercedes to Brown Buick, and that does influence you. And then change schools, older, older, uh, older people. Like then you, you're not suddenly the oldest on the school. You're the youngest. You're, you know, and the whole girl thing. So, so yeah. And what, what was the? So you said you went into sports. Like was that an escape for you? Like sports was I escape. Would've... Now that I'm explaining, now that I'm speaking back to you and everybody yeah. who's with us, yes, it was. I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. I mean, do you know these things? But I dove into sports and and probably into like fantasy worlds of TV and, and sports was part of that, obviously, but not only like mm -hmm. movies and television shows. Like I was definitely, and I in many ways still am, pop culture informed as a 13 year old mm. I was really getting like my world from the television but I love playing sports you know like I always loved playing hockey and baseball and I love that to this day like I miss that male camaraderie that a good sports team has mm -hmm. did you ever that, went like, pro like or semi-pro no like playing it no no but I played baseball up until my graduating high school year and that was a really special experience to jump ahead five years but i played baseball i actually changed high schools to play baseball 
Mm-hmm. So I was going to one, I was going to one high school and we were like an underdog one year. We like made it to, we made it to this like stage where we were playing the team that ended up being like the, it was the best team in our area and ended up going to the finals of the whole, like our whole province. I don't know if you guys know what a province is, but it's like a state, like you're like big yeah. region. It's like, yeah, it's a region. Yeah. Um, on, Ontario. And um, one year, the, my graduating year, well, the year before my graduate, I guess it was the year before my graduating year, I was going to a high school. And in that, at that high school, we were like the upstart underdogs. We beat the best team. I was a big part of that team. And then the, the, the win that we got was taken away from us. There was, they, they, um, what do you call it? They protested the game based on like time or something like Mm -hmm. some technical, we ended up losing the game. It was so heartbreaking and they end up going to the finals and, or like, yeah. So they were like, the big bad team Mm -hmm. um the next year i changed high schools to be on that team Um, (laughs) so (laughs) so and that year we end up going to the finals of the province and almost winning it all and we played in the big major league stadium and that was my last like competitive hurrah in in like taking sports super seriously for sure that was a very special time no we lost in the, we lost in the last inning there was like it was like on tv i was like weeping i was crying i was so sad <laughs> yeah yeah of course if somebody you know if you're competitive and you want to win and that doesn't happen and you put it all in i mean like you said the, the sports was like all, all your world and besides television at that time um so okay cool and what happened then you know after high school oh after high school I mean, how, what, what was next for you, right? We, we get a picture. So there is Lawrence, let's say, at the end of high school. You know, you've been affected by what happened at the age of 13 with your parents and, and then those changes from grammar school to high school. Sports and television was your thing, like where, where you went and, you know, there were no problems existed. How did you, maybe, maybe, maybe also a question, how did you face problems at that i mean problems or challenges at that time you know like with parents or or with friends you said like you know the politics of the friends and stuff like that did you like were you a guy who openly speak and was direct or did you like hide and didn't want to look bad and you know how did you face those things i didn't have tools to face it properly that's what Mm -hmm. i would say um yeah, well, maybe, maybe also a question. Like, for example, yeah, you know, like here's an example of something that like sometimes still kind of lingers with me when I forget how old I was. I was like, probably about a teenager. I was, I remember playing catch with a friend in their backyard, throwing the ball over his head, breaking the window at his house. And like, he was my best friend and we just like stopped being best friends. And that had to be me. Like, if I'm looking back, I didn't know how to face that. Like I broke his window. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't know how to take responsibility for it. Yeah. What did you do? Did um, you just ran off or what happened? No, I mean, like I ran off. We saw each other at school the next day, but like, I was just so humiliated and embarrassed. And I di- I guess I didn't know how to take advantage of it or take responsibility, excuse me, for it in terms of financially. Mm-hmm. So it was like, like I, I probably in retrospect didn't want to speak to my parents and like have to deal with their wrath mm-hmm. on the situation. And we just stopped being friends. Like, I don't even think we ever really talked about it. I remember that it really lingered with me. I wish I had landmark at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Well, you have it now. You can go him now <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> it's true. It's true. The, and that's yeah. some of the stuff that you're supposed to like jump into is like yeah. the integrity of like a relationship at 14 years old. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but that's shit. that's exactly why I'm asking you know because there these these are life things life happens you know these are things that happen in life and as a teenager sometimes you deal with situation like you know with the good with the outcome that you want and sometimes you just don't know how to deal with it and maybe in that retrospective what would you like what would help you to get those tools through those years like what what did you maybe miss at the time as a teenager that 
if that would be existing, I don't know if there was a person to talk to, you know, and stuff like that, or if there would be, I don't know, some kind of show that would actually teach you. I don't know. It's my favorite thing to, from Landmark, or maybe it's the thing that jumps out the most. I don't know about the, if mm. it's favorite or not, but it's the one that jumps out the most always when I have these kind of conversations is the knowledge that I have the ability to have difficult conversations that will finish well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have that then. I didn't have that then. I didn't see a way out of problems. So I, yeah, I'd probably run away from them or ignore them. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's still, I mean, it doesn't come up as much, but it's, you definitely, there's still like an essence of it. You can feel it when there's a conversation or that somebody who you're sitting with talking to or in relationship in, in whatever way, um, there's stuff that's coming up that you're like, you want to talk about it, but you don't know necessarily how to approach it. And now I'm, a, I'm I, I have much more perseverance. I actually enrollment and perseverance and, and belief that a difficult conversation could go well. And sometimes difficult conversations don't start well. Mm -hmm. And to have that, to have that confidence that like something that looks like it's going poorly can finish really well that that's a, i mean i'm i'm so i'm so fortunate that at 41 i have that and i'm still uh -huh. developing that and it really like talking about it is that is it gives me like this teenage hope and excitement for my life today in the sense that oh that like i'm only going to get better at that and that opens up a lot of doors within us and in the world. Mm. Yeah, I mean, a oh, great answer, right? If as the time of the teenager, when you're actually like shaping yourself and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, the big decision steps in, uh, in a way, so that you have the ability, you know, that you can end any conversation well, right? That both parties go away, like being respected and, and maybe not always satisfied, but also, but, you know, not ignoring or running away from problems or, or talking with your ego. So you have to win in the, in the, co in the conversation, but it's actually something, something there to like express and, and just be with it. Do you know how important music is to a teenager? Yeah, I know. Because I asked them what is, you know the two favorite hobbies of teenagers these days is sleeping. I would and listening to music. Sleeping is a hobby. Sleeping is that they, they, I asked them what do you do? Okay, not a hobby. I would say like this. I asked them what do you do in free time? And the and the two most common answer is sleeping and listening to music. You could do both of those at the same time. You could do, and probably they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know how important music is to a teenager? I mean, Definitely. Music we... sh shapes the mind, shapes the life, yeah, shapes yeah. the life. I'm just thinking of like the concerts that I went to and the music I was listening to. Like It does. It, from it, the big... No, no, I was saying it does, right? By music, you can also see like people like, you know, uh, how to say, uh, make difference between each other by the music. Oh, you're listening to pop. Boo, I'm a rock and roller. Yeah. He's I, a rocker. I, That's he's a, a rocker. I'm a rapper. Right, right, right. And it's like, and, and that's, that's, that's what we had in high school. Yeah. yeah. We had like the Genos, like the mm. guys who like their hair that look greasy and like mm. their clothes was like nicer. But then they would dress up like, like in really baggy, like urban outfits. Like, it, and then there's the rockers and the goths. There is all kinds of different. Yeah, it's so true. We're definitely, like identified by our music. I was more. I've always been like more of a pop music guy, and just like good, feel good, or feel anything music. I always like feel, just mm. feel, but not anger. Rock kind of like took a while for me to get into rock. Although I could appreciate a little bit of Pearl Jam or Nirvana nowadays. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so now we have a picture like who or how Lawrence was as a teenager. And what happened then? You know, you finished high school. So how did, did you went to university? Did you went to work? What, what did you do and what was behind it? 
why why did you do that so and just by the way before I, we, I, we go on just by the way so mr jp my wife say says hi guys and karina says hi guys you know karina from the other she's here she's course. listening she's listening hi karina how is karina <laughs> Uh, she's awesome. Still single, but also <laughs> I have to say that, Karina. Sorry, <laughs> don't don't be mad. Don't be mad. But but she's single, so <laughs> any good guys, you know, who likes to take care of the lady, go for it. You know, she's worth it. I like her. Yeah. I like her. She's always a very good support. She she still is. She's like also part of the team for the stream. I have a whole, whole team behind for this streaming. I have a graphic designer, video editor, you know, stuff. She's helping with the social media. So, yeah, basically for now, it's everything uh, assist, like assisting, volunteering, like nobody's getting paid. But when the stream will grow, then we'll start to uh, making it as a business. Yeah. What's that like creating a team of volunteers? Like, that enrollment process can you can you talk to us about it a little bit yeah i can i mean for for me it was pretty easy to do it <laughs> it was just like i call and i say look man i'm doing this uh with this intention like talk shows podcasts i'm streaming also call of duty because gaming is one of the things i love to do and you can easily connect to the teenagers these days and then uh and then yeah i just said to one guy and we talked actually with Robbie, who is video editor. He was the first one. And we talked and he said then, yeah, man, I can do that. I'm interested in that. And now he's basically from being unemployed or no, he was self-employed and, and like being personal trainer. He, through the Corona time, he discovered his passion is in video editing. And so he started with stream and then he was contacted by his former employer and he's now having a regular job, video editing things for them and, and making applications. So, so it's like, you know, you create with intention and, and the context. And I said, guys, look, we're building this and I promise you at the end of it, we will be abundant in every way. Um, and yeah, they all see they can uh, get something out of it. So Rock, who is a graphic designer, he saw the opportunity to develop him in a new way as a graphic designer because for graphic for streaming is a bit different than what he was doing and yeah then you have moderators for chat which is my brother and and uh slow assassino is his name matei on on twitch so those two and then i rolled karina if she would support me with the social stuff and she said yes and then I wrote Alex, who is leading podcasts with me. And next week we're having two ladies to join us. Also, Ula and Dema will be with us on podcast. It, it was really easy for me. I just called people and said, hey, do you want to do this with me? And they were like, uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> I'm like, OK, cool. So nice. Was, yeah, nice. So, so it was a really easy process. So. Sweet. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so back to you after high school <laughs> what what did you decide and, and you know i mean yeah what, what was next for you i started working around that time like i started getting mm -hmm. jobs there's a couple of things that actually happened now that i think of it i started get, making money like i started like working as a waiter and making money like all of a sudden i had money and i and all of a sudden i had access to a car so all of a sudden like girls were a thing um not that i would date a lot of girls or whatever but like all of a sudden like i knew how to deal with it you know mm. like there was a little bit more there was tools and instruments in play so like but um so i started getting work and i started making money and started serving tables and i think through serving tables i really got to work an amazing gift that i still have in terms of just connecting with people like talk, you know, like serving tables and enrolling people in another beer. Mm. Um, it was fun. It was fun. Um, you said that perfectly. Was... Enrolling people into another beer. <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's the awesome expression. <laughs> but it's true. It's exactly yeah, yeah. what we're doing. Well, at that, the that's time. what the waiters do. Yeah, that's their job, basically. Yeah. yeah. I would steal money like I was definitely like like I just wanted to win and I'm like and I would like me I, me and my friend had a job at a restaurant where we would like put a 
fifteen percent gratuity on every party, no matter how like it was like you would get like a gratuity, like a, like a tip that was mm-hmm. like added into the check, um, and you would get that only if it was a party of ten or more. And what would happen is we would just put it on everybody's bill, and so people would give us would pay for fifteen percent gratuity, and they wouldn't check the bill, and then they tip us on top of that. So like, I was just like breaking the rules and and stuff like that i would lose jobs and get another job i mean it was that period that like i was definitely like figuring out how to work in the world and also Mm -hmm. like sometimes sometimes getting you know like failing hard um but i think it was also at that time where I was right. I was about 19. I started dating my best friend's older sister. All right. <laughs> that was a life shift for sure. She was four years older than me. And she was, I looked up to her. I looked up to her. She was a former child actress and was very successful. And I always wanted to act. And her family had a lot of act. Like my best friend had acting experience. So I, when I dated her, that world i had access to this world of becoming an actor i started taking acting classes getting like pictures done um headshots and 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 started looking for an agent um that was an interesting time i was definitely like again a fish out of water but i put myself into it fully and Mm -hmm. i ended up getting a small part in a movie we ended up in 2000 when i was 19 going to the film festival and con um wow. i mean running around as if i belonged there which i didn't uh meeting celebrities befriending celebrities like just like having these crazy experiences in like hotel rooms and like just it was crazy and i think that really opened up the world to me in a way that again was shocking <laughs> I had an agent. I remember like he he was a he was a gay man and like I remember that also being like meeting my first gay man and 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 being around people that weren't like the people that I grew up with. So that was interesting, but in that moment I was aware that I could make money, but I also really wanted to be an actor. Mm-hmm. I wanted to act and maybe just before you continue one question i have here is like what gave you the drive to go for this it's like it, would you say you were being so courageous or you know where did you get that you said you were looking up to your girlfriend but you know what gives you you can still look up to something but you don't do much into it what gave you the the boost that you said i'm going I think there was an inner belief that it was like something that I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So in a way you would say in that moment you discovered your passion? I mean, one, one of them or baby. It's so hard to say because I didn't know what, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I just didn't know. I didn't know otherwise. Like it was the best thing I can think of. It was like at that point at 19, I wasn't going to become a baseball player. That was obvious. I went to university, but that wasn't, it didn't work out for me. Like I wasn't into it. I wasn't paying attention. It was, I I didn't understand why I was there other than all my friends had taken the next step too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Um, one one question I want to ask you. Did you went to the university and what happened? So that. I did one year of university and it was a super, it, once again, it was like, I was there for social reasons and I wasn't aware of how to deal with them. Like I just was, I think socially awkward in a world that I really wanted to be socially masterful. Mm-hmm. But I think that I like, so there's probably a lot of masks put on or just a lot of attempts to make to, it was very much like now that I think of it, like reliving that moment when I went from like when I went to high school for the first time again it was like whoa new world dealing with like a whole new standard of living I went away 
I lived in another city. Um, I did not know how to focus. I did not know what was going on at school. It didn't work out for me, like academically. I think that it was a great experience, like experiment and experience socially. Um, but yeah, and it was like that summer when I came back from my first year of university where I ended up like becoming with that well it was that that university year and up to there where like I was like in that relationship with my best friend's older sister um and I think at that point I was like university was so not inspiring to me it didn't make sense to me Mm -hmm. not that it couldn't be and not that I'm against school it's just like I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I don't think that I had the right um, context for school. Mm -hmm. So I think acting was just like this other thing. It was just something, something that was possible. I I certainly wasn't going to go to school and be an accountant. Like that was not like my style and I wasn't going to be an athlete anymore. So I found ways to make money, use my personality, develop my personality. And I wasn't a good actor by any means. Sometimes I still think, like I think of myself now as like every, my girlfriend will say to me, you're such an actor. Why didn't you act and <laughs> professionally? And, and, I'm, and I'm like, I still sometimes don't believe in myself in terms of like really, in really like taking that art form to the level that like I believe that it should be taken to. Yeah, but um, I will stop you here because what you're saying is great. And great because you said, but I did part of the movie. I went to Cannes. I meet those celebrities. Maybe maybe mm-hmm. tell us who did you meet? Like maybe that we also knew. Did you meet anybody like, you know, like Tom Cruise or I don't know who, I don't know, Brad. You know? I would have loved, I would have loved to meet Tom Cruise. He was my okay. favorite of all time, of all time. I would have loved to have met Tom Cruise, but I never met Tom Cruise. Um at that film festival, I met Mila Jovovich. I made friends with the guys from NSYNC, like Justin Timberlake and and like a bunch of the guys in that band. Joaquin Phoenix, Jared Leto, Elton John. I saw perform like in the same room. There was those are famous people. Those are yeah. celebrities. You know those. Those, people, those right? are those yeah. are celebrities. I have a picture of me and Chris Rock like crossing the street from 2000 in Con. Like there. <laughs> there was just like it was it was crazy um yeah and that's why i meant like you you were there you were with those celebrities and you still say i you know i'm not sure in my arting art performance which is like you know it's it's it's, something that's funny a lot of people deal with right even though you had some success you might still doubt in yourself yeah, I think it's called, what's it called? Like the Stockholm syndrome or imposter. And no, no, imposter syndrome or something like that. Where like, you don't, you're there, but you don't believe that you deserve it or something like that. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, it, yeah, like I had what, what in, in Yiddish you, you call chutzpah. I had balls, you know, <laughs> like I, and I, st- I probably still do in some sense, but I would just be like, I be- <laughs> I hope you do. No, I would, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I belong here. I belong here. I'd fake it I'd for sure. Like fake it into parties and get mm-hmm. into places that maybe I didn't have an invite to, but we ran around con and like talking to different studio managers and being like i can you get me a ticket can you get me tickets to this party can you get me tickets to this party i remember seeing dennis rodman like it was just yeah it was crazy but that was like that was a short amount of time and i you know what's funny one like one of my best friends i met on that trip like we're like he was there separately and we're still really close so that was definitely like if it was only worth me meeting my buddy jb um then it was worth it too yeah but yeah, like I think at that time, like I was trying to figure out what it meant to be an actor, but like I didn't know what it meant. I thought it meant like you're good looking, you have a nice smile, so they're going to hire you, like, you know, but that wasn't happening. And what that led to actually was when I was 23, I moved from my hometown to Vancouver. I moved across the country. Mm-hmm. And that was an, that was a huge leap for me because I never really came home again. 
Okay. I never, I never really ever returned home once I left home. Now, what did you do in Vancouver? What, what was the reason that you moved to Vancouver? It was this. Well, acting? I went there because yeah. I wanted. I went there as an actor, mm -hmm. and I left there as a yoga teacher. How did that happen? So much. I mean, shit, you go but... from from Khan to meeting Jared Leto, Dennis Rodman, and stuff like you said, Chris Rock, and so on. But you know, and you come home. You moved to Vancouver as an actor, and you said, "How how many years later did you left Vancouver as a yoga teacher?" Four years. I got there and when I was twenty three. I left when I was twenty seven. How did that happen? Going from an actor to a yoga. Well. I started out as acting, not knowing what I was doing, just trying to get work. Mm. So you went from and audition to audition. Is that? Yeah, I yeah, went yeah. from audition to audition. I had one moment that was pretty big for me. I um. I won a contest from this this channel called Much Music in Canada. It's like our big music station. Mm -hmm. You know, like the VJs. Now we're going to play the top hits, and they would do like shows and stuff. And it was around the time when they were doing like reality shows where they would invite people to be the host. Like, who's going to win the like the best VJ? So I get picked to go into a competition with another guy. So I fly from Vancouver to my hometown of Toronto. Um, I, I I go on air as a VJ, and in the competition, I horribly lost. Like that guy, like just was like perfect, and he knew this, he was prepared, and he ended up winning the whole competition. And he just like demolished me. Like they, they in voting, like the yeah. people would vote like who they want to see go on, and I was like, how did they not pick me? <laughs> how is this possible? Um, but they okay, didn't. you lost and to the champion in the end, which is okay. You know, it's always a consolation. I, no, I'm joking, but it's I know, but I, right? I didn't yeah. know. I was just like, I, I thought that I was like, I thought I was going to be the champion. So, that I flew back after that to Vancouver, and everything changed. I was in so much pain that I knew that I needed to start taking shit seriously. Mm -hmm. I started taking acting classes. Um, I started really like learning the craft. I was. It, well, where did yeah. you get? I'm. Um, you know, where did you get money from? It's like all being paid from that movie that you went to Cannes, or did you do waitress? Or? No, no. Me. Um. When when I moved to Vancouver, I was making bank, doing selling, concert, and sports events tickets on ebay okay i had a really good friend I, i had a buddy who i met that lived in la and we had this operation set up where we would buy tickets all across america and sell them on ebay and we were making really good money so in my time in vancouver pretty much most of it towards the end it started changing but i was always like just like i had money for rent, I had money for food, I had money for marijuana, I had money for like whatever I wanted to do and acting classes also, I guess. Um, so that's how I was making money then, which was kind of a gift and, and, and also at the same time, so weird because you're hustling, which I think is a really important thing. Like when I talk about perseverance or having, having courage um, and having, and like thinking outside the box, especially thinking like selling stuff on eBay Today, it's like obviously a normal thing, but at the time, it was like that was out there a little bit. Mm -hmm. And 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 at the same time, I also see how like because I always lived in that in that fishbowl of like hustle. It's like make make it work, at, like hustle, make it work. That like structure is something that I have to develop for, in myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah yeah all right and how did you then meet yoga i mean so yoga was introduced to me in theater school mm -hmm. and then my voice coach was like you got to go you got to go do yoga and, and what what were your first and, thoughts about you got to go do yoga lawrence what did you think about it 
like to be uh, honest at that time i was open to it i okay. didn't really understand what like what it was mm -hmm. but she she did point me in the direction of something that felt more athletic and sweaty mm -hmm. you know like more sporty more gym like so i thought of it more as just like oh okay cool i get to go to like to do a jimmy thing like you know that is gonna like, make her happy or at least benefit me in the way that she says that i needed to develop okay which was like feeling deeper relaxing but I did, like breathing deeper so my voice was better i did not understand the depth of what was going to happen i didn't understand that i was just i was more so just like taking somebody's advice yeah okay and what happened then how did you know how did you why did you became a teacher i mean did yoga so much impress you or did you really discover something newly into it and you said okay i want to pass that on to other people it's like i think that well no i don't know like let me let me tell the story and maybe that it comes to that yes yeah, but, okay i mean i think that like it was ego related mostly like i mm -hmm. would say that in the sense that i found something that i was now doing that made me feel good about myself in a way that sports made me feel about myself in the past that I had lost. Mm -hmm. Acting didn't really feed me like that. They're like when I would get work, it would be great, but it was so rare. And then like somebody else would always get work. There was just, it just felt like a lot of competition and I wasn't winning enough. And I didn't really, I wasn't a good actor at that point. I wouldn't, I didn't understand the difference between good and bad. I just like would judge myself. Um, but yoga gave me a space that I can go. It was really, really challenging. It was such a challenge. Um, but because it was such a challenge, but when it was over, I felt like I won, mm -hmm. you know? And I felt differently. I started feeling calm. I started feeling like I was in shape, I guess. Like I started feeling my body in a different way that's, than I did before. Like I was really noticing my body and, and I was living in a new city and I was like, I just felt like I was in, living a new lifestyle. And it gave me a lot of, like Vancouver gave me a lot of chance to, and yoga too, gave me a lot of chance to think for myself and be on my own and really develop new thought processes that weren't available to me. I grew up around one kind of person and one kind of thought process, one kind of way of life. And, and this was true to me. And then I moved mm -hmm. to Vancouver and all of a sudden I was around many different kinds of people that, that didn't that i wasn't usually friends with that didn't get a chance to connect with deeply in my old world because i was because i had so many friends from that world um so my time was always like dedicated to the people that that were like-minded and that i grew up with and and knew me in a certain way and all of a sudden i was free to recreate myself not that i knew that that's what i was doing but in in vancouver and through yoga i was free to really recreate myself and what yoga gave me like acting was starting to turn at that point i started mm -hmm. to see myself as an artist i never saw myself as an artist but when i started seeing myself as an artist i started writing i started directing i continued to act but i started to have a little bit of authority i started to like be like i understand the art form i understand the process of going deep feeling into yourself and i started i think it was at that point that i connected as an adult spiritually like i started having like mystical and magical thoughts and experiences through yoga mm -hmm. um and but but that jump to become a yoga teacher it, it really came because the people that i was hanging out with that were practicing yoga they were so much cooler than the people that I was hanging out with that were acting. Mm. Like my community inspired me. I love the people. They had opened business, yoga studios, you know. Um, their lifestyle was about being healthy. We were beautiful because we were always in that hot yoga room. Um, I was connecting with women in a way that I've always wanted to, like, like they were conscious. There was probably older women in my life too that were able to sh help shape the way that I see women, help shape me as a man with women. 
we were talking about things that normal people don't talk about because we were talking about it in the context of yoga, of feeling your body, of experiencing yourself. Um, of being able to control yourself. Like it was, it was the, <clears throat> it was a lifestyle of self-development that drew me to yoga. And also I saw yoga, not as like people might know yoga, but I saw it as a platform for personal development. And because of my dreams of being an actor, and my experiences as an actor had me standing on stage. I had already seen myself on stage. And so I saw being a yoga teacher as maybe an opportunity to be on a, a stage. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, what's interesting? Like I was scared to stand in front of people and talk. You know me well enough. You've seen me like stand in front of people and talk a lot. Um, a lot of people, like we've been in rooms of 200 people and picking up the yeah. mic and, and it's it, it it's not that it's ever easy, but it's quite natural to me now. But at the time, I was devastated. I remember, like, to go back to when we were thirteen, when I was thirteen. I remember, like, like all the kids were having bar mitzvahs, like that that passage to yeah. in Judaism to be a man. And one of my friends had a had a big party, and at his big party, the DJ asked a couple of his friends, me being one of them, to go on stage and rap. And I remember just like, again, being so humiliated at how bad of a rapper I was because in my head, I was like Eminem, but like in reality, I wasn't. And, and how hard it was for me to pick up the mic and to stand in front of people and to talk. Um, and I guess I initially saw yoga as an opportunity to work that skill, but it wasn't until I got ingrained in the community and, and, yoga started being something I could do. Like I got good at asana. Mm -hmm. I got good at like the yoga poses. Just, like I was wanting to stand on my hands or, you know, like I started figuring out poses. And then this philosophy of this tantric philosophy was introduced, which said that whatever you do or whoever you are is okay. That can't like being yourself can be your spiritual path. Mm -hmm. and when I heard those words I was able to infuse my yoga with it and that inspired me to share that experience with other people so thank you because that's true you're right like it, I was really inspired I was like oh I think I can do this better than most people do this okay and that's when I wanted to be a yoga teacher. It also, it's, I mean, it's different yeah. now. Sorry. Oh, I just, it's different I, now. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Go ahead. We keep cutting off each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like, I usually do that uh, during like to interrupt and make some points, you know, so people can, can take or, you know, what I, what I got present to. And here is the truth said, you know, like you said, in teenage, I played baseball, I played, you know, hockey was the one sport. So it's like, there is this natural thing for you to compete, right? And and then you came to this yoga, you discovered all this for yourself that you said, and you wanted to inspire people. And there is this thought, I can do this better than others. And I think that is awesome point, you know? So yeah, I can do this better than others. Okay, cool. I took the opportunity. You go out there and you start teaching. Uh, probably you didn't compare and, and make fun out of others like ha 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 I'm better than you but I mean that in, in a way when you when you realize that that you are actually you know you want to do that it doesn't matter what the thought process is behind that's what my point here is like somebody would say I want to do that because I really feel good into yoga and I want to give that to people you had a thought of you know I can do this better than other people out there and you went out and do that so that's what I want to give here to people. So it doesn't really matter the thought process behind. More matters is what you do and, and what you do when, when you do it. Like how, who you are when you do it with the people there or whatever you want to do. So, so yeah. And, and it's a, I had one question all the time in between in my head was like, 
So you were this guy in Cannes meeting all these celebrities. How this, if you can share that with us, how does that impact on you, you know? But one day you're hanging with Chris Rock and, and, and you know, you said with the NSYNC guys and Justin Timberlake and la 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 with, with those celebrities in Cannes. And then you come home, like, was that for you? Like, okay, man, you know, if I can be with them, I want to be more with them. I'm going to, like, how, did that influence you in, in a way? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think that, like, going back to teaching yoga, I think that I always saw yoga as, like, it didn't feel to me how, like, the industry or how somebody might think of it now. Like, I literally did yoga in Vancouver, and within a few months of becoming a teacher, I moved to Hong Kong, and mm -hmm. I worked for the biggest yoga studio in the world. How did you and get it? I, was, I mean... I will break you up when you were saying things like big things like that, because that is yeah. how, you know, you find your, somehow you find your passion, more or less it, it comes by it by coincidence, but it's that, something that you like to that do. Com yeah. That community that I was a part of in Vancouver, mm -hmm. that community had, we would call them um, spider webs all over the world. But mm -hmm. specifically, there was a spider web between Vancouver and Hong Kong. And my teacher to this day, I still call him my teacher. He's my friend. I still call him my teacher because, man, sometimes you can really appreciate people in your life and you don't always appreciate them. You know, like mm -hmm. that competitive streak that you're talking about, I competed with my, with, with his name's Patrick. I competed with him for so long. And when during this, quarantine time when everybody went online I started spending time with him and I was like fuck I forgot how amazing you know and and I was and I look at him and he was so inspiring like yoga was cool I enjoyed it but I think it was still quite feminine mm -hmm. even the men that practiced it would like tend to take on feminine attributes or or characteristics and when I finally found men that were able to be yoga they were yoga teachers but they did it m like m it felt masculine mm -hmm. and i was like that's a rock star in my eyes that was a rock star in my eyes and that's how i saw myself like i saw myself through yoga preparing for something that's ro rock star-esque in the sense of holding people's attention taking people to levels of emotion that they normally don't experience. Um, and I love the yoga as a tool because I, because I myself used that tool to feel those things myself. Like I completely expanded my consciousness, expanded the kind of conversations I was having, expanded the world. Like I started traveling, like yoga literally gave me the opportunity to get a job in Hong Kong so mm -hmm. if moving to Toronto Vancouver was challenging or like or a big deal then within a few years of that four years of that all of a sudden I'm in Asia that was just brilliant that was so like it's still to this day part of my identity like I'm sitting here in Bali and and I feel settled here. I'm here for seven months and I, and I plan to stay and I feel somewhat settled. Um, but I remember a few months ago saying like, I didn't want to leave because like, I felt like it was part of my identity before I understood why. Mm -hmm. And I think like, and I've probably spoken to you about this before, just traveling the world and being in cool places that I really love or that I'm fascinated by that's always been a like maybe not always but for the like since con and since vancouver and then since hong kong like those three major trips changed my the world became small it right. became small really fast and that is something that i love to do i love i i love the world like i love traveling i love living in different places 
I mean, it's just brilliant what you're sharing. And, and there is one thing that you, that you mentioned in all this is like, right. That you find a man like Patrick, a man who is doing yoga masculine style. Right. So maybe mm -hmm. here's something we can like you from experiencing and teaching it. Right. Why is yoga so popular more amongst women than men by, by your experience of it? It's like by what you saw. And, and talking to you this way. I, yeah. I, I think that women have, I think that ultimately women with, women with spending money, like with spending power, have more free time, number one. Mm -hmm. um, so it just makes them more susceptible to taking on any learning whatsoever i think just i think that if i if i'm right women tend to like continue education through their life just more more at a higher percent than men so i think in that sense um all right that makes that, that that makes sense i can but i think that, that i think that women also are more open to naturally to sense to sensitivity to subtlety and yoga sells subtlety and it gets you there in different ways and it's not always subtle but i think yoga really gives the sense of subtlety and of and it does bring someone masculine back to center as much as it could bring somebody feminine also back to center like towards the center um but i think that i mean more men are practicing yoga every day there's no question about that But yoga definitely in itself is a f in the modern world, because I know, like, I'm hearing my girlfriend's voice right now saying that classically yoga was created only for men. And, and that's true. Um, if we look at the history of yoga, but All right. I think that in the modern world, where we're at today, the qualities that the modern yoga practice has in terms of exercise, in terms of staying in shape, in terms of healthy eating, in terms of having a mind, like a still mind. I think those are things that women more have more interest in. Whereas us as men, as a, as a species, as a gender, we tend to be drawn towards that which is more aggressive or violent Um, so, so I think that's why it tends to be more women, mm -hmm. but, you know, and then there is the question, which a lot, like, you know, with the people going around is like, yeah, you do yoga. You like you said before, even a man who does it are like more feminine in some way. So, you know, acts like that. So did yoga take some masculinity from you? Would you say it's like, you're less raw now than you were before? Uh, I mean, you know, in a way, did, are you less man than you were before? I don't know how to ask it, but I think you understand what I want to ask. Look, no, I don't think so. I think that I'm a great um, rendition of a man. Um, and I think that yoga and my yoga practices and all and, and a lot of the self-development stuff that I've done, I think that that has only added to my man. With that said, There is a sensitivity. Maybe, maybe share with us in what ways added you to a man, like like from practice, like how did you mm -hmm. maybe maybe give us a few examples? How did you deal with some situations before yoga and now how you deal with them? What's what's the difference? Yoga has taught me that I can breathe. And once you're breathing, you're in the moment. Mm -hmm. Once you're in the moment, in that moment, you're being yourself. And it's not that I don't leave the moment or, or get caught up. But the fact that I have these tools that are accessible, that even if I don't use when I need to use them, somebody can say to me, man, you should have done that at that point. And I'm like, oh, you're right. Which means that I can still self-correct along the path. And I'm a man, you know, like I... I'm a masculine man and being in the moment allows me to be myself. So 
I think that there's a lot of like stereotypical, like very effeminized men, men, men that go to yoga. And I understand that like the practice of yoga and the spiritual practice around it is subtle. It creates sensitivity. So those are female qualities or excuse me, I'm not going to say female. That's not the right word. They're feminine qualities. And because they're feminine qualities, what happens is like, I personally can get to a sense of feeling more sensitive than maybe I want to feel, or yes, I, I can like get emotional in a, in a moment that maybe I'd rather kind of just be like iron mm. and, and, you know, but that's part of the tweaking process because what yoga has done, it's opened, it's, it's allowed me to open up the different channels that I, the different states that I can operate under. Now, controlling which state comes up where, that's the next level of mastery. And it's definitely part of my daily practice and part of my yoga, per se. But, but one of the first stages is just to learn that these different states exist. And some of these states are, fe are feminine states of sensitivity, of, of being soft, of, of, of being vulnerable. And those can all also be really honest for a man but mm. but but so that i think i think that's how i would answer your question i think the, the vulnerability has allowed me to live a life in general where i don't i take less bullshit it's not that i don't take bullshit but like if you can't handle my vulnerability, you're probably not the kind of person that should be in my life. Mm. Yeah, got it. And, and and vice versa, and vice versa for that mm. sense. Like from if me for you, you know, it's like these are like creating safe spaces and making that important. In, in some in some way, that's very feminine. In other ways, it's like this is my home. This is my space. This is my atmosphere as a man that's like like building a platform uh, a cave for yourself you know that's yeah. like proper that, it, that you can be yourself in that you can have a spider-man head and a you know and like you have and i have deadpool have that's deadpool not spider-man that's, oh, that's deadpool. deadpool ryan deadpool. reynolds oh, yeah man i mean better than spider-man if you ask me but you know. <laughs> hey but no no I, what you're sharing is is really awesome because it's like you know that and it's in a way what we can also put out there. It's like through yoga, you became even like what you shared, even more man, because you, you're now, you know, you're settled into who you are and you are like freely, you can freely uh, share that with the others. And you have mm -hmm. the lines, like you said, like, you know, if you can handle my vulnerability, well, then you you are no place to be around me and vice versa and i think that is something that you know if men would know that more like you said more and more men are doing that but you know they would do it more um, and and you, when you said you know i learned to breathe my immediate thought was yeah man everybody breathes but maybe just tell us what does it really mean to breathe consciously breathe there's a difference you're 100 percent right everybody breathes um everybody breathes unconsciously and when you're breathing unconsciously, what you're doing is you're breathing shallow. Mm. So you're not getting like your breath is your connection to that inner voice and to your inner spirit. And when the deeper you're breathing, the deeper you're feeling yourself, the deeper you're, you're experiencing your voice when you speak into the world, but also the deeper you're actually literally experiencing yourself as a, as a human organism. And what that, that, what I meant by that deep breath is like, it's the, when you're conscious of, you can't be, you can't do two things at once as much as we love to multitask, right? You can't do two things at once. So if a conscious breath is happening, then you are here and now mm -hmm. you're not in the future. You're not in the past. And we know how we can get stuck in those places. And we also know how, when we get stuck in the future or the past, we know that we're really stuck in something else, what's called an illusion. And the only time that anything's really truly real is in this moment. And we so often get stuck in illusion or in our perspective, or we know better or looking good or whatever, all like whatever other things that that, like you take that breath 
you take that breath and if you're lucky for a moment, everything goes away. And the only thing that is left is that is what is so. Yeah. Right. And when you're left with what is so, there is an ability to see things as they are, including seeing yourself as you are. And, and that's like the most honest place I think that we can be. Yeah. Awesome. You just, I mean, you share it brilliantly. And, and when you said when you are with what is so, you know, the, the extension of that is you can also be with what is so you can say to that. So what, you know, so what if you exactly. don't have something and you can go somewhere or so what if now is a quarantine and you are at home and when it's so what it doesn't feel like big and, 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 you know, limiting, but it's like, okay, but what I can do with this now, you know? So you can either mm -hmm. be the victim of the circumstances or you can be okay with the circumstances. And I think well, like you perfectly said it, breathing gets you into that moment. Okay, be present to what is so. And when what something is so, it's also so what? So, okay, what are we going to do next, you know? <laughs> so that, that I think that's awesome. I mean, the the connection that, that you were making. So, okay, we were we are now in Hong Kong. You're teaching yoga there, meeting Patrick, the masculine guy who introduced it. Okay, <laughs> yoga can be masculine. So, so that was at the age of, you said, 27, no, tw 27, you left Vancouver, you said, yeah, moved to Hong Kong, right? You're now 41, yeah. living in Bali. So what happened yeah. in between? It's like, did you move from Hong Kong to Bali? I know you didn't, but, you know, for, the, for everybody who's watching. I, I, the, the truth is... I actually did. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I actually did in 2011, oh, I think yeah. it was. Oh, yeah. Because I was living in Hong Kong till then. I ended up, um, well, what happened was I ended up leaving. I was working for, the, for Pure Yoga, biggest yoga studio company in the world. And I left them, but I stayed in Hong Kong and I started working on my own. And, and after a terrifying week of being like what am I gonna do like you know I was a huge culture shock of all of a sudden not having the big machine supporting you um I just started getting private clients started making connections started teaching on my own and I was doing really well very fast and it was really amazing um I, I remember at that point I went to see Anthony Robbins in New York mm -hmm. Um, and I started traveling to Bali and I just started getting job offers in Bali. And for whatever reason, I decided to stay. I really liked Bali and I didn't want to go back to Hong Kong. It, that in itself took me on a whole new path because like I was in a year for Bali and then I ended up spending some time in Australia. And so I ended up taking a job in Australia and that was you know a, an interesting detour um i'm glad i got to do it because i got to live in sydney which is a beautiful city it's very affluent i was making decent money i felt good about myself and i was getting to explore myself again in a new space it was recreate all, it myself was, a little just to confirm it was all yoga teaching right yeah, up to that point, it was all yoga yeah. teaching. I'll just break here. So we have a new follow follower, which is Verlich420. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the family. And Rastek resubscribed <laughs> for three months, which is also awesome. Thank you, Rastek, for the support and love. GG. Okay. So, so you're in Sydney now. And I know you've been in Moscow. So how did you get to Moscow? And why, why Moscow? And, and, you know, what's the from Sydney, what was next? Well, my parents are Russian speaking. That's okay. just something you guys should know. Cause so I, I like my, in my childhood, I think a part of like my identity stuff in my childhood was like a lot of my friends, most of my friends were like Canadian parents. I had Russian speaking parents. It was felt a little bit kind of out of, out of mm -hmm. whack. Um, but it was something that when it's, I was in Hong Kong and then in Bali, I started meeting a lot of Russian people my age that were traveling. Um, and as that was happening, I started to like all of a sudden make friends and connections based on like just having cultural things, like having cultural things in common, 
mm. based on based on that um and one day a couple like hired a private yoga teacher and i was that guy and they happened to be russian and they happened to not speak english and it kind of just pushed me into the situation where i was trying to make some money teaching a yoga class a private yoga class to people who didn't speak english so i was forced to use the little russian that i knew to speak that created a conversation and a relationship with those people that ended up being a business in St. Petersburg, Russia. And at that point I'd never been to Russia, but I was invited to come and and I enjoyed it and I was and I liked Russian culture and Russian people and 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 I also saw that the Russian yoga world was different than the ro- yoga world that I had come from. Mm-hmm. It was it, it was at a different stage and and it was expressing different things. Um, and I felt like that there was a hole in the marketplace that I could help out. You know, I thought I was, I had something to offer. So here I was like horrible speaking Russian. And I decided to move to St. Petersburg mm-hmm. and we opened up the first hot yoga studio in that city. All right. Just quick question. What, the, how does hot yoga differentiate from yoga? What's the difference? Um, it's like a, so imagine yourself practicing yoga in a 40 degrees heated room like it's super it's super hot and mm-hmm. and what it does is it allows for your muscles to stretch a little bit easier because they're being heated by the atmosphere you, not just be, you know your own responsibility but now the atmosphere helps you go deeper so it's a great yoga practice for people who are just getting into yoga just mm-hmm. beginners um it's a sweaty practice like you can imagine yourself like feel like just being drenched in sweat yeah uh and it's exhausting and it's super challenging so i think the relaxation comes in the few moments of rest during class or maybe at the end of class when you're finally finished but it's a pretty it's a pretty intense experience yeah okay cool. it was my first yoga practice it was my it was how i got into yoga I think I needed like something that was really physically challenging to get my attention, something that was going to be, that was calm and, and not too strong, wasn't going to keep me interested for very long. So hot yoga really pushed me to my edge. And after a while, I loved it. Yeah. And, and it makes sense, right? Like if we go back, you were, you were a competitive guy, like sports, which is, you know, always to the next level. Uh, challenge yourself to the max and as an athlete for uh, me former athlete and you being athlete we know that you know you have to go to the max and a little bit over so that you set a new max and new max and new max all the time so so yeah. it's kind of a mix obvious that you know that because that that's what i also was dealing with, like so how did somebody who is acting and it's competitive in a way that ends up in yoga which is relaxing and all about breathing and now moment and like you said settling down uh but yeah it does make sense through hot yoga you 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 challenge your body and then you find the spiritual realm of it i would say i guess i'm like in some ways somebody who loves adrenaline hot yoga is like just full of adrenaline Mm -hmm. and i think for me what's interesting about that practice is how do you get how do you stay calm when your body's feeling like it needs to save itself you know how do you stay calm in stress and not just how do you get calm but in stress how do you get calm okay cool and you're now in st petersburg opening a studio seeing an opportunity for a whole new market for hot yoga uh -hmm. well, well then what did you discover there? What did you do there? I mean, it's really brilliant what you're sharing. So if we if a little bit sum up is like somebody who grew up by Russian parents and, and that happened with the Mercedes Buick thing. And then hmm. what you shared, the whole teenage stuff happening and experiencing different stuff, having an older girlfriend, being to con, meeting celebrities, want to be an actor, didn't really find yourself in acting, meet yoga hot yoga and and you know that was something adrenaline challenging yourself settling down becoming a yoga teacher and you said i love to travel which actually it's like you just combined it perfectly right yoga is something that is worldwide so basically you can 
teach anywhere in the world if you probably you are also good right that people like are saying would you want to teach here or would you say maybe that's also a question on this pet and this Saint Petersburg would you say you get the job because you were good at it or because you speak multiple languages or because hot yoga was something that was not taught and they just wanted to have something different I think initially one uh two and three and then one I don't think anybody knew the difference between good or bad mm-hmm. I mean good and or I bad think, but... yeah okay like you know like I wouldn't say anybody knows I think to this day like very few people know the difference between a good yoga teacher and a bad yoga teacher it's like yeah sometimes you have a bad experience or maybe sometimes you're bored but I don't think anybody really knew that I think that like really the first the two it you know like I spoke to I spoke Russian somewhat and um I knew I had like hot yoga experience and I think like the people that were the most important ones liked me mm-hmm. and once I got there I already had a lot of experience I mean when I got to Russia St Petersburg I was 33 so I had already been teaching for six years and I had a lot of experience and my experience was alongside some of the best, I would say, young yoga teachers in the world. And I also had access to like experience some of like the oldest yoga teachers in the world, you know, like I was in a, I was very much in like the international yoga community. So I had a lot of had a lot of access to a lot of different practices and a lot of different po- points of view and, a, and, 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 and to people who were doing it successfully. I think that was the most important to me. I think that's the, like, that was the, always the most important to me. Like, is this person a good yogi? I didn't care as much. I mean, like, obviously like if somebody's touch, teaching a good yoga class, I would be touched, but I was always like, is this person making a life for themselves? Mm-hmm. Is this person living a meaningful life? Is this person like developing? Is this person getting better? Is this person growing? Like, remember like the different influences I had. I had just like some of the most interesting people in the yoga world were like my best friends that like I started practicing yoga with. So, so yeah, that was a big deal. And, and when I was doing that in Russia, I don't think people knew the difference until I got there. And then they were like, Oh, this guy stands out. This guy like can like really goes, this guy really goes deep and he really puts his all into it. And you can tell that he really loves it. And, and I love storytelling. Like I think that actor in me Mm -hmm. that is a love for storytelling. I love telling a good story and I found a place that I could do that. I found that I could do that through yoga. Like you can theme a, you can, you can theme a class and you can tell a story. You can make a yoga class about integrity. You could take a look at, you can take a look at the alignment and you can be like, you're out of integrity. <laughs> you need to get back into integrity. And you can take a look at your body and the way that you move it and the way that you breathe. And you can see inconsistencies and, and dishonesty and and then you can restore integrity by taking responsibility for how you feel about yourself, how, what you feel you're able to do. And also you can take responsibility for doing less, for, for just experiencing yourself as you are without having to push yourself sometimes. And I'm saying all that because I saw yoga as a, extension of my acting and I don't think that my acting was never was really acting like I think acting in itself was just like my gateway to writing and to storytelling and I think that yoga is is that as well I think it's an extension of that storytelling love like I was able to find a platform where it's using my body and and guiding people through their own internal stories so we can free ourselves of our stories or at least see them differently okay i mean it's just so 
term I would say moving and touching what you were what you were saying is like look look look, ha- look, yeah. look 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 I see yeah what is you that, see that? Like? that is an animal that's a get that's a gecko gecko right nice. there yeah you know what I have Just on my move. screen fly I have a fly <laughs> on my screen yeah I got a gecko <laughs> you have you you right yeah you're in Bali you're much cooler than we are here in Slovenia in <laughs> lockdown you know? you're like <laughs> <laughs> we, we we are locked down like like shit in a toilet and we get fly to the apartment you know it's like <laughs> can you do me a, can you do me a favor yeah. you're making me uncomfortable can you put your mask on please <laughs> why <laughs> just joking i'm just joking <laughs> that, 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 yeah okay okay <laughs> just put your mask it's on it's a bad joke well, we can, it's, a yeah, bad nah. it's a bad joke but it's a good one i just i just didn't connect it right away I didn't expect it coming you see <laughs> that was it <laughs> okay cool so but no what you're sharing is is really is really is really awesome i mean you know uh, explaining yoga in that way and how you know you combine the extra thing with this is just like the more and more you share with us is like the more and more we i get in touch hopefully also the people who are watching like who you really are like you know that you know even though you want to be an actor and there is all these sides you still incorporated that into i would say for you yoga perfectly combines like you're challenging your body you are doing the yoga, which is on pushing the body to the limits, which is adrenaline stuff, like you said, dealing with stress. And then you incorporate in the storytelling, like, you know, the and, and other people can resolve some things or see some things for themselves, which is basically the next step for every actor, I would say, you know, that you get people conscious about who they are and how they are dealing with life and move them maybe. That's, I mean, that uh, that's what I about, that's what I loved about acting. When I fell in love with acting, I fell in love with it because I saw it as a path towards self discovery. And to be a good actor, you need to know yourself. You need to touch parts of yourself that most people don't explore. Mm-hmm. Um, and you need to also put all that shit that you're living with away so you can be raw in the moment it's a really when done properly and deeply it's a really beautiful art form and i think that most people don't appreciate it as much i mean unless you really like jump into it the way that i did and experience it and maybe i'm wrong maybe everybody does appreciate it but it's really something quite beautiful the process of taking on a different human being's experience Mm. yet through your body through your spirit through your interpretation um that's compassion definitely that is putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and see and see the world from that from from there yeah which is which is which is something that i'm also like really standing for that you know that you know, before you say something or you do something or even when you say it or do it just for a glimpse, maybe put yourself in the person on the other side into their shoes and and just see, you know, how would you feel if somebody would talk to you that way or, or do that thing and then you react or do what you want to do. I think that's something that's missing these days in the world and, and you just open up something new for me was like how... I never saw actors in a way that you just explained what actually inspired you by acting, you know, because mm-hmm. we see these actors and you see, you know, you see Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, you know, guys like that. And you're like, yeah, you know, those are guys that are doing it. And, you know, they earn a lot of money. We don't actually see the, the work that is behind, you know what I mean? It seems so easy, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you go out there and you're filming Mission Impossible or Troy or The Last Samurai or Avatar or whatever movie, you know, and it's just like, it's so easy, you know, you just go there, you know, everybody can be an actor, you know what I mean? But the truth is far from that. And on the other hand, everybody can be an actor and everybody actually is actor. <laughs> so, <laughs> putting masks on, just, not every, just not everybody are living by, from it. So, so yeah. 
it's very true it's very yeah. true what you're saying awesome so so be excited for Peter, pet petersburg and you know opening did you have your own studio there or do you, were you employed by somebody i mean i had yeah it was my own studio we had we had a guy that the guy that i met in bali he was mm -hmm. the major investor and he asked me to come on board and i came on board and they just wanted me there for a few months but i ended up staying there for two years mm -hmm. and i really loved my saint petersburg life i really loved it really really loved it i loved my studio um we created a beautiful community of people who had never practiced yoga before that just became like yogis for the first time and mm, it was a very special time in a very special city if you've never been to st petersburg russia man you got to check it out especially in the summer it might be the only it might be the only city that's that's open in the summer if things don't change <laughs> yeah. um but you you also but, like, said before that you love russian people like why what why it's like you know most of the I world think, doesn't you know, doesn't I, know how russian i mean love but you said uh, yeah. i think initially because i wanted to understand my own family mm -hmm. i think okay. like to understand my parents um who are ukrainian born but soviet union like i like a russian culture was was part was my domestic culture at home growing up so i think Part of it was understanding myself and understanding my family and and like mm, my parents aren't the kind of people that sit down and just open up to you, you know. So for me to dig deep into who they are, I had to go to a culture where they were from. Mm -hmm. And I think that gave me a lot of insight about who I am. Um so that's one thing in terms of my own kind of like draw to it. I literally moved from Sydney, Australia to St. Petersburg, Russia. Like I went from like modern, a beautiful weather city to this old, not that it's not, it's a beautiful city too, but the weather's horrible in St. Petersburg. And sometimes the sun shines for only a few hours a day. I mean, in the winter, it, it can be horrible, except in the summer where it's fabulous. Um, but I think I was brave, man. I wanted to, I wanted to check out the dark side. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like live that whatever Russia was. I wanted to understand a Russian woman. I. That's the dark side. I, <laughs> the Russian thing is the dark. I mean, I'm joking here, but you say, I want, I want, I want it, to understand the dark side. But it, and from but, what but perspective, let, dark side? Is. But let's call it what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. even you, living in Slovenia, which is Eastern Europe. I mean, it's Middle Europe, but most people think it's Eastern Central we, Europe. We're, Europe. Yeah, we're below Austria, you know, and Italy is our neighbor, so we're not that east. Okay, <laughs> but, but like, yeah. but you're. But you definitely. But we were influenced the by the by the that culture through former Yugoslavia, yeah, which was. Yeah, yeah, you're the eastern of the central. Eastern of the central, yeah, call it that way. Yeah, let's go like that. <laughs> there has to be east into it. <laughs> but yeah, we were we were influenced by the by the by the yeah. But you're proving you're actually proving my point which I haven't made yet, which I'll make right now, is that you and I were brought up, maybe more so me than you, but where you live right now is very much Tupperware. It's a very much whitewashed world of everything is safe. Everything is, is like in order. Um, fairly stable. I mean, I know that we're living in a whole new world now, but fairly stable in terms of infrastructure and in terms of like government, like having things under control and everybody being like, like smiling. <laughs> and then you go to Russia. Russia is different. It's not pretty. It's civilized. It's got buildings and it's, and it's like, it's built, especially modern Russia, which doesn't look modern is built with 
intimidation in mind. It's built by the Soviet culture. Um, it's the dark side. It is. It doesn't mean that it's dark and it's the bad, it's the worst place. I think that like, listen, one of the greatest yoga teachings, and it might even sound cliche, is for a seed to bloom, it has to be in the dark soil. So, so there is a moist, swampy darkness, especially when I think of St. Petersburg, especially when I think of Moscow, the two cities that I lived in. When I think of a Russian person, I think of a person who is feeling deeply, who doesn't have their emotions necessarily in check, who has experienced depression. And I think all of those things we all feel on some level, but Russians, it's almost okay to feel that. Where in the rest of the world, where I'm from and where you're from, if somebody's like that, somebody's gonna talk to you. You need to change that. <laughs> turn that. Turn that frown upside down. Whereas in Russia, no, you're not going to always turn that frown upside down. There's an acceptance of, of, of that darkness, of that um, melancholy, of that depression. And that in itself really draws me because there's a depth, there's an art, there's a checkoff, there's, there's, you know, like that deep feeling And at the same time, because of that depth, the rebound, the pulsation of the darkness is a bright light, is a warmth, um, is a, um, a sense of family that probably you guys do know more than Canadians know because you live in a culture that is, is not as multicultural as Canada. Um, but I might be wrong about that, so excuse me if I am. But in Russia... You might need to be on the VIP list to get in, but once you get in, your family. And I don't know if that's true in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's true in Slovenia to the same extent. It's definitely not going to be true in other countries that had it good, like Europe, like North America, like Australia. So... Russia, Russia is a culture shock. And at the same time, it's probably one of the warmest and safest places on earth. Well, yeah. Russia is one of the places on earth right now where freedom of speech actually exists. You know, it's like, you might not be able to talk freely about political matters there in terms of if you're talking about political leaders, you know, mm -hmm. but everything else you can say, you can have an opinion being lost in the west so i think that's what i mean by the dark side like i think that i came from sydney man I came from sydney australia good day might yeah and i and i went into living in st petersburg it's a swamp literally the city's literally built on a swamp and the people are amazing, but they're not necessarily healthy. They're not like you're not dealing with the with a population that's like physically thriving per se. So I'm I'm gr forever grateful. I'm forever grateful. I mean, it's forever brilliant. You know that that is what also is just like what this I want this channel to be about is speaking from experience, right? Because if I talk about Russians, I met I don't know maybe three Russian people, you know, so far, and most of them through the through through landmark education, uh, you know, mm -hmm. being, being introduction leader and stuff like that. But you know, hadn't had the experience, and then what you shared is like the vice versa of what media presents, right? What media presents in Russia is like, you know, everybody's frightened. You are not, you're not allowed to say a lot of things, you know, like obedient people. And then you say, no, there's actually freedom of speech, except the political things about the leaders, which is one area, right? And, and I, I mean, that's fascinating I'm on a on whole other level. And what you were sharing about is like, 
similar to my experience in Scandinavia when I lived in Denmark it's similar like you know Danish will be always friendly to you but they won't mm-hmm. be they won't accept you as your friends like your tight tight friend you have to like prove prove to them in a certain way if you're a foreigner you know what I mean so if you're a foreigner you're probably I know exactly what you mean you will, you will be with foreigners in the country but you will not get in into a Danish culture except if you know uh, you stay there for a long while or you like you said you're in VIP lease and then your family yeah yeah <laughs> but I mean I, I just want to thank you because like getting to riff on this and like talk about it really um it really drops me into the appreciation you know like it's easy for me too to be like my standards are are different or I'm different and than than the Russian people, but really like getting to riff on this, it's like I I really get that sense of like how strongly my purpose is is interrelated with with the Russian soul, with the Russian person. Mm-hmm. With the, you know, there's something about that ability to to be the underdog and rise up to be so deeply misunderstood and not give a shit that other people don't understand you. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the confidence, the confidence you have to have and the pride and the will to be like, have the whole world against you and still show up. Russians do that, you know, Russians do that. So, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just awesome what you're sharing. It's like, and yeah, I think it's it's one thing, you know, that, you know, what I want to show through these all these shows and guests who were here and you and guests who will be after you. It's like, you know, there's so many different paths, and and you know, you can just find. And if you want to travel and do something, I mean. You you made it perfectly, like you know, yoga teaching. It's all over the world, and you went out there, exposed yourself, willing to learn. You know that that is one thing that is always there. If you want to succeed in your passion, is willing to learn and to expand beyond. You always for something new, open for opportunities. That is so far the like the red line of every guest I have who is who find their passion and they're living it is all being open up to opportunities you know not being closed down and being in your micro micro space and you know this is it i'm not going to move but they all are growing and expanding and you know you're just doing that worldwide some people are doing with different with different uh, sponsors you know however it doesn't matter but being yeah. open for opportunity yeah. and yeah yeah, and then it's so great, right? Then you're invited to a show like that and you can share that and suddenly, you know, the the people who are watching this get a different perspective on Russians than, you know, people who, what we listen from the media, which is not from experience, but this is from experience, like directly, somebody who lived and integrated in the, in the writing into the culture, not into the, the tourist sightseeing. Right, exactly. Right. And exactly. just brilliant. So, how did you then come from Bos- Moscow to? You said you were living in. Maybe this question: What is the difference between Moscow and St. Petersburg? Moscow is the big city. St. Pe- Pe- Petersburg is like it's a very. They're different. They're different. They're both Russian major. The two Russian major cities, but Moscow is the king. Moscow's got this like air of Americana. Mm. which is a funny thing to say, but it's got a little bit, you just have a, like more people who are internationally traveled. You have more, you have a middle class in Russia. You have people with money um, where St. Petersburg, I don't, I mean, that, ha- that it just, it feels less than mm. Moscow's more modern. It, it's Moscow's like, it's got a little bit of Americana. It's got a lot of Asia, it's got a lot of like, like these, and then it's got a lot of Russia, like a lot of old Russia. Um, and it's a it's a tough city. It's it's big, and everything's far away from each other. Um, it's so big. I don't love big cities. 
I don't love big cities. So Moscow was harder for me. I like cities that are more compact. I like cities that feel like towns. St. Petersburg feels like a town. Moscow feels like, like Moscow is like how, it's like how long am I gonna have to live here to know this city? Like, it's like that, it's big. Um, and Moscow separates it, like people in Moscow are really easily separate themselves because it's so big, because it's like there's far distances because there's so much of everything that it's easy to just hang out with the people that do the things that you do. That's at least what I found. Whereas St. Petersburg, you have a lot more overlap. It's a lot more artsy and creative. Uh, Moscow is much more economically driven. Mm. And St. Petersburg is super romantic, man. Super romantic. It's got bridges and rivers and bridges that open and close and boats. And, and it's, built like, it's built like Venice or, I mean, or like Amsterdam. St. It's, it, it's, it, Petersburg was, is called the gateway to Russia, Europe's gateway to Russia. It was built as, as, as like a way to show off Russia to Europeans. Mm -hmm. because, because it's the most western of russian cities so the idea was that europeans would come and they would get this idea of what russia was through saint petersburg whereas moscow's it's got much more th this feeling of intimidation of authority mm -hmm. yeah awesome and i mean it's just great what you're saying you said the feeling of a town i just want to put it on a scale so how much uh, people live in St. Petersburg? About three to six million. Like I think three in the major <laughs> core and then six million. Oh, so man. it's like... No, I'm just... I'm laughing. You know what? Yeah, but you said, you know, Moscow is big and St. Petersburg, it does feel more like a town. And then... It the, does, why, though. why I'm asking is because, you know, I'm currently living in, in the capital city of Slovenia, which is Ljubljana. And the population is three hundred fifty thousand. You know, and for no, me, I, for me, yeah. that is a big city. It's like for you know, when when I get to London, I don't even feel the big city. Of when I was you know traveling up and down to London, I didn't even get the feeling that London is big because I was mostly in one part of it. You know, through 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 what we've been there together as well. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know what I mean? And, and when you said yeah. you know, Saint Petersburg is like a town, and it's three to six mil. I'm like. Bro, well, <laughs> no, but I get, with... but I get, you know, you, you grow up in Toronto, moved to Vancouver, lived in Sydney, in Hong Kong, which are all big city, massive, massively populated. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's, and that's what I, I mean, want to show here. It's, it's whole different perspective on, on the things, right? Moscow is 17 million people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, is that even humanly possible? I get, I mean, it is more. because it exists. I'm being told but, yeah. more right now. Yeah. You know what's that? That's eight and a half Slovenians. It's seven. It's Moscow. So in Slovenia, yeah, like, two million. Is that even humanly there. possible? <laughs> like, can you think about all of like the like? That's insane. Yeah. It's insane. And the weather shit. It's not like Los Angeles, seventeen million people plus. It's like, it's like the worst weather, twenty <laughs> million people. <laughs> yeah horrible and at the same time th the dark side is where is, is it's the dark fertilizer it's that darkness from the fertilizer where the be most beautiful things are born <laughs> yeah it's just amazing how you put the perspective on that as well uh before when you said you know for the seed to grow it needs to be in a dark moisty weather and and you find that in russia uh through through all the things that you share so how come you know you didn't stay in moscow and and you went to bali with yoga it's like it's like well, hold on a second but, but, yeah so there's something else missing in the in this part because you just moved to i was living yeah. in moscow i was living in moscow and like look i don't think you i don't think it's possible to live in moscow without at least having a dream of leaving moscow it's just okay so intense it's such an intense city and there's so much going on at the same time but i was living in moscow and i went on a trip with 30 with 30 of my students and i took them on a on a yoga tour to bali and i happened to leave moscow on the 15th of march 2020 and coronavirus happened to close the world down on the 20th of march 2020 so 
like a like a gift from God. I stayed here. I could have gone to Canada. I couldn't even go back to Russia right now. Mm-hmm. Like, Russia is not letting in, as far as I know, to this point, people without a Russian passport. Um, so the only place that I could go was Canada at the time. I mean, I guess now there's other places that are open. But I'm on the best island in the world. Don't tell anybody because it's good because there's very few people here. <laughs> but it's really the best island ever this is the best place to live awesome so yeah i mean you know you did a lot of more projects and if people want to know you, you just follow lawrence or yoga fi on on instagram and you will see everything uh i think the purpose here is uh like you know we we fulfill the purpose so how did you find your passion and what were you dealing with growing up and you know what is then necessary for you to 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 live to live the life that you're passionate about and also to get us i mean you know to put a different perspective on yoga and and on russia from the experience and mas- being a masculine in yoga that's just awesome i mean you said you're living on the best island in bali and there's very few in the world in I the said. world my my bad not bali in the world yeah i mean <laughs> Is that from like from everywhere you've been? You put that you put that uh, perspective on, or you know why? Why would you say is the best? Like, if you would, if you would be um, like, look, why would I would why would I live there? It's like if you would be selling me the island, what would you say? Um, I mean the life on island, not the island are, itself. Things are fair. You can get be, because there's no there's no like there's a limited amount of tourists here. Things are very affordable right now. The infrastructure is in place to live the best life. There's amazing restaurants. I think some of the best restaurants in the world are right here. And like healthy food. You can live a healthy lifestyle. The weather is ridiculously amazing. Um, I I work out at the best gym in the world. Like I have a spa and a gym. And I, so I get to keep in shape. The, um, the people that are on this island, they're so interesting. They're diverse. They're from all over the world. Um, the Balinese people are so lovely. They're so hospitable. They're so polite. Yes, the Wi-Fi here sometimes isn't perfect, but in terms of quality of life, it's just fantastic. Like, yeah, it's just it's a place full of people that create, dream, and realize. All right. And and you can do it in a way that's super healthy. Like super healthy and super enjoyable. All right, I guess I don't know how but we are going to Bali. <laughs> nah, <laughs> for what I want to do, I need a good good internet connection. So if there is a Wi-Fi You can there, find it here. You, you okay, can okay, find cool. It here. Okay, cool. So then we just make this stream really big and then we move to Bali. Uh That's it. That's it, and we get teach yoga by Lawrence and and healthy style by by you. Uh, and I would really enjoy that and love that truly because uh, you know we also did a seven months program together and and you know being around people who did that is just awesome. Uh, so yeah, Karina in between answered that she's great, and she's asking you. So do you still have your things apartment in Russia? Because you said no. You- I packed up a couple of days before I left. I just like everything worked out so perfectly that I had a circumstance at where I was living where I had to just pack up my stuff. It just it in the moment it was a shock and 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 un, unexpected, but it worked out perfectly. So my stuff is packed up in like in my friend's storage unit, mm-hmm. and I'm here with clothes for the last for ten days. <laughs> this have lasted me seven months. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're on the <laughs> island, man, with the perfect weather. All you need is a bathing suit or what is called the, the short for swim, and that's it. <laughs> what else do you need? And, oh, I... and this tank top slash something. Uh, yeah, so Karina, slash something. Karina said it's like you went through it all so you can really appreciate where you are now. Amazing. Yeah, thank you, Karina. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I feel that. And and again, thank you for this conversation because it really 
to go through this it's like okay that that's definitely like unwinding some things and I feel grateful I feel grateful for the life that I live and sometimes it's easy to forget about that you know you go on default mode mm-hmm. and I lost my credit card the other like yesterday you know that 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 can be bad but it's not that bad actually it's just another thing that happened it's what is so yeah, you just lost your credit card. So what will you do about it? You can moan and whine, or you can go, you know, cancel it and order a new one, and that's it. Yeah. Ah, awesome. And and that is actually what you were just saying. It's like a hidden object, a hidden agenda of this show as well. Is that actually people who come here, did they get, uh, did they get overlook on their life? It's like hidden gifts from me to the guests which they usually don't do or you know we, like you said you know uh we don't usually think about who we were as teenagers what we were dealing with and what we went through to the point where we are now but once you do it you're like inspired by yourself i think that probably every guest till till now and every guest afterwards will will get that uh, you know, seeing a 13 year old boy who did my bar mitzvah <laughs> and now living in Bali, enjoying the life with a girlfriend and, you know, no tour is just really awesome. So, yeah, thank Lawrence, you. really thank you for, for being here and sharing that with us. I think, you know, it was really, it was really valuable and, you know, whoever wanted to get something, they will uh getting out of you if nothing else go to bali enjoy the bali life or you know uh get the st petersburg romance and and especially i think yeah do do whatever exercise if yoga is that i think it's also awesome i also did it for for a while and it was it's, it's a brilliant thing to stretch your body so thank you Lawrence. go sleep i know it's late where you are it's almost midnight right yeah, it's three minutes to midnight. Three so thank minutes you. to midnight. So it's three minutes mm. to five PM CET in Slovenia, which is like we're in the middle of the day. Uh so yeah. Really thank you for being here and taking time for this and I don't know what to sell say else, but you know. Keep on living the the island of the gods, the god wo- the god way, the god mode. <laughs> GG way. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Uh, There will be another stream starting at 8. We're going to play Call of Duty with the team. We are practicing for the tournament. We go on to play on Saturday. So that's kind of going to be cool. It's like I'm also dreaming my life. You know, I wanted to be a streamer and now I am. And I wanted to play games competitively and now I am. So, you know, it's never too late, even though I'm 33, I'm doing that. I just found some new exercises to for the muscles and wrists and arms to stretch them and make them stronger. So to be more competitive, exactly all that. There is some Dr. Levi, I don't know, who is especially practicing for gamers. Yeah, around the world, the other side, stuff like that. You, you know all the exercises, you know, but yeah, nobody taught them. Like, you know, you know there is something, but you don't really do it or you don't see the value. Exactly. All those kind of things that you're, that Lawrence is just showing for every gamer who is watching this. Keep on observing. But I will present them as well later later on. I will. We just had the podcast on habits on Monday, right? So I'm now just into it. Like, there is a challenge. Look your activities and are they supporting your lifestyle? And if not, bring in some new habits that will support the lifestyle that you want to live in. You know, that's kind of it. So see you in a couple of hours. Uh, otherwise, there is no talk show on Sunday, but there will be podcast on due to the holiday in Slovenia. It's basically honoring the dead. So and Sundays are in Slovenian. So I didn't book any guests for that. And then on Monday, we're having a podcast joining with two ladies. So it's no more going to be just me and Alex, but there will also come two ladies with us. So, yeah, and the topic is expectations, which is, you know, a brilliant topic to have. Uh, So, yeah, thank you, everybody. That's kind of a quick schedule for this week. Thank you, Lawrence, for staying in. I wanted to share a little bit what I'm doing uh, also with you now. That's why I keep on having you here. And, yeah, let's stay in touch uh, somehow, you know, through a Wi-Fi. (laughs) All right, everybody. Have fun. Bye-bye.